Well, if you're new to Cheers this morning, we just want to welcome you. You've been here for a long time. We welcome you as well. Uh, we're just uh, passionately in love with Jesus and just believe that he makes a difference in our lives and in this world. And uh, there's no greater place to be on a Sunday morning than in church. Amen? Um, we are very blessed this morning to uh, have a special speaker uh, all the way from the rough streets of Penticton, B.C. <laughs> Greg, why don't you come? Um, Greg and Karina, they showed up in the church about, I want to say close to three years ago. Not quite. Not quite. And um, they have been a blessing to this body. They've been a blessing to us personally. And uh, we're just, God's really stirred a lot of things up in Greg, especially uh, over the last couple of years. And uh, God's been working on his heart and his mind. And, he's, and so God really began to speak to him about his testimony and just wanting to share it. So uh, Greg put together this thing. He'd been working on it for a couple months. And he put it together and he sent it to me and said, you know, just whatever you want to do with it is fine. Um, but I just really felt I need to take this step of faith and, uh, and send that to you. And, and I went through and I was just, wow, well, this is awesome. And I sent it to Dennis and he had the same response. And so um, I don't know if this is what he envisioned, but uh, so just be careful if you ever send me anything. <laughs> because, you know, here at Cheers, we just love to put people on the spot. <laughs> make you face all your fears and uncomfortableness, but uh, no, so I'm excited, Greg, um, again, you guys have just blessed us, you've been blessing this body, and uh, you're a big part of Cheers, and we just appreciate you guys so much, so Thanks. without further ado. I have to say I absolutely love God's sense of humor. It was back in January, I was just about out of work, and I mentioned to Scott that I was running low, if he could keep me in his prayers and his thoughts, if he were to run into something, and I don't know what prompted him to ask, but he says, uh, so is there anything you said you wouldn't do? And I said, well, something to the effect of preaching and drywall. <laughs> so <laughs> God's been faithful, and uh, I didn't miss hardly a day's work. Um, my new boss has had me doing quite a bit of drywalling during the day, and uh, God's had me doing a lot of work on this stuff in the evening. So. Sorry, I am nervous, and I'll try not to read straight from my notes the whole time. The Bible's pretty clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you can confess your sins and believe that Christ died on the cross for you, you've got your golden ticket, you're going to heaven. You can coast through life if you choose, that's grace, you'll get into heaven. Grace is enough, but for, forgive me for putting it this way, grace is just enough. I want more than just enough. God's book is full of promises, things that he would love to give for his children. For years after accepting Christ, I was content with just enough. But time and time again, God has proven that he loves me. He's shown me that there's so much more available than just enough. Romans 8:28 If we can get there we know that God causes all things for good Understand that God's your father he's your dad he's the perfect dad For those who didn't grow up with a perfect dad which is likely all of us God's the dad who wants to cause all things for good But there's a bit of a catch if you read the fine print in 8:28 he causes all things for good for those who love him, for those called according to his purpose. I know that if you're in this room, you're called to his purpose because no one comes to Christ lest the Father first call him. I struggled for years and years. Well, God, I want that. I want all things for good. But how do I work up this feeling of love? Like DC Talk says, love is a verb. It requires action. Would it may be fair for me to reword Romans 8.28 to say God works for good, all things who walk in obedience to him? Now, for the record, grace is enough. Don't let me push you away if you're not ready to up that level of commitment. Some people run to God. Others take baby steps, and we get there just the same. Whether you're the hare or the tortoise like me, know that God loves you unconditionally, without fail, 
there's nothing you can do to make him love you more or love you less. Think of the prodigal son coming home after squandering his inheritance that he demanded from his dad. His dad could have just made him a slave, which is what the son had hoped. But instead, the father wrapped his own cloak around him, slaughtered the fattened calf or whatever it was to celebrate his return. That's the love that the Father of Heaven has for each and every single one of us. That's the love that I long to experience more of every day. I long for his fullness in my life. I long, long for faith like Paul, never a doubt in his mind of where his next meal comes from, never a doubt for his future. That kind of faith, Paul's faith, that, that deep trust that God will work all for good, can't be taught. Maybe it's gifted on occasion, but usually it comes from walking it out day after day, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of your feelings. 1 Samuel 15, 22 poses the question, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience? And the answer is to obey is better than sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice, and it's through this grace, through Jesus, that we're admitted into heaven. But it's obedience that I believe opens up the avenue for all of God's fullness and blessings in our life. So today I share my testimony, my family's testimony, but more than that, I hope to share his story in my life. My testimony is my journey of moving beyond just enough, living solely under mercy and grace, and the principles that help me to walk out love the verb when I don't feel love the mushy feelings. I feel that God's calling me to be way more transparent than I would ever be in the natural, especially into a microphone in front of a bunch of people, and know that I'm not here to toot my own horn, to boast in my own walk, or my examples of obedience. I'm human. I'm far from perfect. But I truly feel God's calling me to allow, allow me to use him, to use my family's testimony to illustrate his goodness. And I hope that it's his goodness that shines through today. My testimony is linear, but I'm going to rabbit trail on a couple of issues to expound on what I learned as I was going along through my walk. I grew up in a secular home, uh, with a workaholic father and an increasingly emotionally distant mom. Church and youth groups were allowed, if I chose, but they were never encouraged. And to this day, I get a, the sense that there's hard feelings with my family about religion, and I don't know where that comes from. The core values taught in my house were work hard, play hard. Work always came first, but when work was done, you were allowed to play. My dad taught me if it was broke, you fix it. If you didn't know how, you learned. If you needed a new one, you built it. And I still operate that way today. As our reward for our hard work, we had access to a family cabin on the lake, and we took our summer holidays there or in an RV. We skied, we hunted, we fished, we worked hard, we enjoyed life. My parents had little in common, and as their relationship with my mom's family collapsed, we lost access to the family cabin, and... I know there's more to the story, but it seemed like working for our holidays at the family cabin were the glue that held my family together. After we lost the family cabin, uh, my parents divorced when I was 15. I was quite blindsided by it. I was rather devastated by it. And I sought comfort with the wrong people, the wrong habits. For the next year and a bit, I dabbled in a world of drugs, alcohol, and the occult. Just before grade 12, something in me woke up, scared of where I was headed, knowing I wasn't headed down the path I was called to live, not that I knew what that was. And by choice, I moved in with my dad, knowing that he'd hold me to a higher standard, a standard of uh, hard work, sobriety, and discipline. That's exactly what I needed at the time. I ended up finishing grade 12 with great grades, with the exception of English, and several top industrial education awards. You want to go forward a couple slides, Greg? One more. That's me at the family cabin. This is actually our engagement photo before we knew it was our engagement photo. <laughs> I met Karina at our dry after grad, uh, the very last function of the year. We clicked immediately. But as I learned, she had two kids and an ex-husband. I was 18, looking for fun, not commitment. After some months, we bumped into each other again. We dated briefly but we weren't headed down the right or the same road. 
So we called it off, but somehow both of us feeling it wasn't over between us. I went back to school for one more year, and after a little more maturing and realizing that the high school prep crowd and their habits weren't going to get me anywhere, Karina and I began to hang out on a regular basis. She had grown up in a Christian home, turned away from her convictions for a spell, and was now beginning to rebuild her relationship with God. We had many great conversations about life over the next few months. She wasn't just an attractive woman, but she had something attractive on the inside that kept calling out. She invited me to church several times, but that didn't fit the life my dad had exampled for me. I didn't see how putting faith in an unseen God would better my future. After a while, maybe against our better intentions, we became an item. For Thanksgiving one year, we were headed down to the coast to visit a friend, and I'm driving her car, and she confided in me that she hoped to settle down and marry a good Christian man someday. My initial reaction is, what, is she dumping me from this relationship? We're not... (laughs) This relationship that we're trying not to have while I'm driving her car? (laughs) Realizing I didn't want to lose her to Mr. Right without seeing if I could be Mr. Right, it made me curious enough about Christianity that I joined her at church just to see what it's all about. After attending church for for a while, with my eyes wide open and asking a bazillion questions, I asked the God into my heart in the spring of 96. At that moment, I knew without a doubt that God and the Holy Spirit were real. That's another story. My first challenge uh, as a Christian was the tithe. Our church taught Malachi 3.10 as if it was current law. Bring 10% into the church. And I was saved by the gospel of grace, and now people were encouraging me to go further, to give out of what little I had. I'm 19, a new Christian. To give 10% to my church with my background really didn't sit well. Karina and I had a lot of conversations about it. She uh, assured me that she had seen God's provision time and time again. She told me of a cream container in her family's fridge when she was a child that didn't run dry, and how... Despite the fact that she's a bookkeeper, she very often can't justify her paid expenses with her income. Even on social assistance with two kids at the time, she believed in tithing 10% and knew that God took care of her 100%. She also reiterated the Father's heart for his people. Matthew 6, 26 says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than the birds? See, he sent his son to the cross to die for you and only you. Yes, you're more valuable than the birds. She told me that we're to put our trust not in our own strength, but in God's provision and his love for his children. She also pointed out that Malachi 3.10, to the best of her knowledge, is the only verse in the Bible that says, test me in this. In obedience at first, I began to tithe. Obedience became habit, and with time, Obedience turned from habit to desire to, I wouldn't consider not giving. Tithe is one of the first principles I believe God would hold us to. He commands us to avoid the love of money, and maybe part of tithing is to test the motives of our heart. Perhaps tithing in part is to support great churches like this one. God tells us time and time again to trust him. By giving back 10% of what he's provided, we're saying, I trust you. However you look at it, argue it, Tithing is an act of worship, laying it down as a sacrifice at his feet. Since attending that church, I've seen and heard many good theological arguments that it is still law to tithe. I've seen and heard many good arguments that it's a principle, a covenant agreement that we need to stick to. I could fill this rabbit trail with scads of scripture, be on the topic all day, I won't. Myself, one of the pastors, or any number of people here would love to talk about it any time. After months of sketchy employment and being faithful to tithe on the little that I made, I was granted a full-time job just two months before our wedding. It was low-paying, but it was steady for seven years. He placed a job in my lap from a resume I'd forgotten I'd delivered, and he provided at the right time with little room to spare, as he is so good at doing. We were married September 6, 1997. That's Virginia and Eric when they were young. They adopted me just as easily as I adopted them. We were married September 6, 97, and we took a cheap honeymoon over to the Kootenays. My first day back at work, I, I cut my hand on a miter saw. It was enough to get me an extra two months honeymoon, courtesy of WCB. 
I feared as a result of it, the, the cut tendons, that my hand wouldn't work the same, but God saw fit to restore it to 90%, or 99%, and he held my job for me as well, which I also feared losing. Um, while the work was menial and repetitive, and my employer was ungrateful, it wasn't really a job that I wanted. Despite the changes that I helped to design and implement in the place, they couldn't even give me a pat on the back, let alone a bit of a raise as thank you. That's when I learned the second principle that I think we need to stick to, to work for the Lord and not for men. Colossians 3, 23, 24 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that the Lord, from the Lord you will receive your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. I know when I work for God, I work harder, smarter, more efficiently, and at the end of the day, regardless of what my boss says, I know it was a good day. I remember several times over the next seven years crying out to God, get me out of this place. And he'd very quietly and calmly say, it's not time yet, which would make me mad. He didn't care. (laughs) As time went on, I knew his plan wasn't for me to move from that place until I'd learned every lesson I could there, and I was moving to a better position elsewhere. So I made the most of it. I worked for God day after day. Turns out that job was probably more stable than any other I could have had in Penticton through those years. And for his provision and the varied experiences, I am more than grateful. Our son Josh was born just a few months after our first anniversary. By two months, uh, Josh was showing signs of not being well. He was quite jaundiced, even though he was born quite pink. Uh, He went through numerous tests in Penticton and Kelowna, uh, numerous therapeutic treatments. Nothing was working. Uh, We went down to Children's Hospital, where Josh underwent more tests, including a bone marrow biopsy. Um, There was talk at one point of possible bone marrow transfusions. Uh, There was a lot of scary stuff thrown around. Despite all of their tests, they never figured out exactly what was wrong with Josh. They said it looks like something called hereditary spherocytosis, but we can't prove it. We'd like to treat him as if he has it. That didn't sit well with us. They were recommending blood transfusions and removing his spleen at some point. They were band-aid fixes to cover the symptoms and do nothing to fix the cause. Because of that, we sought as many natural remedies as we could. We saw naturopathic doctors. We paid for miracles with them, and we prayed for miracles, and we saw none. But we kept trying. Just over two years old, somewhere between two and two and a half, Uh, He was really dangerously anemic. His red blood cell count was about a quarter what it should be. His spleen, which should have been the size of a two-year-old's fist, was larger than my own fist and hung below his ribcage. Because his his spleen hung low, his liver was big, his heart was big, he was at pretty serious risk of accident, and because of his low hemoglobin, he didn't have the reserves to survive an accident. Karina hadn't slept for more than an hour to stretch, nor she couldn't be separated from him. I worked hard at my low-paying job, and I worked hard at home working on the house and trying to keep my chin high. Didn't help anything. We came home one day to a message from our GP on our answering machine. He'd called us bad parents in a message. He informed us if we didn't follow the recommendations of the doctors and specialists, he'd be phoning social services. One way or another, Josh would be going through these treatments that we didn't want to put him through. We had no choice at that time but to put uh, Joshua into God's hands. It was well beyond our control, and we had to trust God because we couldn't trust anything else. Calling the specialists and consenting to their band-aids was probably the hardest thing we've ever had to do. The third principle I I learned uh, is the need and the requirement to trust God with all your being. As humans, we're going to fail. This world is too much for us to bear. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make straight your path. Why? Because he loves you and wants to cause all things to work for your good. After hearing that message from the GP, we spent the next several months in and out of Penticton and Children's Hospitals. Josh had eight blood transfusions, most of them down the coast, because we couldn't stand the local doctor doing it. The doctors down the coast were amazing, uh, but it was pretty costly to get there. 
In total, we had made a half dozen trips down to Children's Hospital, staying at Easter Seal House. We'd drive out on a Thursday, and we'd come home on the Saturday, always pushing the limit for, uh, to stay at work till the end of shift, but always short on sleep, energy, and finances. October 31st, 2001, a month and a half before his third birthday, Joshua had his spleen removed. It was something they'd initially told us to expect after the age of five. Uh, removing the spleen of a two-year-old by choice wasn't something they wanted to do, but the risk of surgery and complications of living without a spleen were less than the risk of carrying on the way he was. I lost a week's work as a result of that. And we spent money on travel and food. All things considered, especially with my low-paying job, we were maxed out. Emotionally, we were drained. Financially, we were well in the hole. We were near the end of our rope in so many ways. Christmas was coming down the pipe with a planned plant shut down, and we had no reserves. Up till that point, other than some help from our family and a local group called the Sunshine Fund, we were on our own. We needed to ask for help, and we turned back to the storehouse, which I misunderstood to be the church. After all, we'd attended and tithed there faithfully for six years. I felt more comfortable asking there than anywhere else. They lost our initial letter, our initial request, and then they turned us away when we asked in person. They told us to ask everywhere, including service clubs like the Elks, before approaching them again. The next Sunday, as with every Sunday, several wealthy people approached us and told us they were praying for us and for Josh. I didn't want to hear it. It was lip service with no action. Yes, we needed prayer, but we needed so much more. Somehow, despite that hurt, my faith in the Lord re remained. My faith in that church, absolutely shattered. We felt let down by our church, so we moved. I hated having to ask for help elsewhere, but we were beyond choice. We approached the local Elks, and even though Josh's case was outside their usual mandate, they generously gave a check for $600. As generous as that gift was, and it paid the expenses that occurred for that week-long trip, we weren't out of the woods. We'd exhausted all avenues. All we had left now was prayer. Virginia and Eric's class, elementary class at the Christian school, had been doing muffin sales through the fall. And they, as a class, decided to give it to our family for Joshua's, uh, to help cover the cost of a trip down for a follow-up visit. Karina was driving the kids to school that afternoon, so she dropped in the chapel where they presented her with $100 in cash. Because of uh, rumors of lockers being broken into at the pool, she'd left her wallet and purse in the van. The van was broken into, her wallet was stolen, the donation was stolen. I got home from work, we talked, broken at this violation of privacy, the loss and expense replacing the ID, and the fact that this hard-earned gift from kids was stolen. Considering we were at the end of our rope, this so easily could have broken us. Karina told me what happened, tears rolling down her face, feeling horrible and guilty for leaving the purse in the van, even hidden and locked, which she'd done because of the locker, locker rumors. Despite everything, she felt strongly, and I did too, that we had to give thanks to God, to focus on Him regardless of our circumstances, to praise Him in the midst of it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 to, uh, 16 to 18 kept coming to mind for Karina. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We had a choice to make. Obey God and give him thanks and praise, or give in to our circumstances and de despair and defeat. We chose to obey God's prompting. It was warfare, and we felt it. I don't, I don't remember if we turned on the worship music, but I do remember we embraced, we wept, we praised God. We declared to God in that moment that we trust him. Despite anything else, regardless of how bad things look, we're still going to trust him. To praise God when you're under attack is warfare, and that's what we did in the kitchen that day. Like with Paul and Silas in the dungeon, broken and shackled, they cried out to God, and God delivered. Unbeknownst to us, a parent from the school had phoned a local radio station uh, um, or two, and from the radio stations, the newspapers found out about it. Within a week, Karina had been interviewed by two radio stations, two newspapers, and a reporter from CHBC. The news of Josh, his health, and the circumstances of the stolen donation were covered all across the valley. 
We had to leave that weekend for a follow-up for Joshua's surgery. We decided to make the most of it, and we got, uh, via Air Miles points, tickets to Science World. That would be our kids' early Christmas present. But that would be their only Christmas present because we had no reserves. We refused to put any presents on credit after the year that we'd had. Joshua's follow-up was an answered prayer. The doctors and nurses were absolutely astounded at how fast his hemoglobin was coming up. He was recovering from surgery without complication. He was healthy. He still had an undiagnosed condition, and he still does as far as we know. But he is absolutely asymptomatic. To this day, he's normal, healthy, and we haven't been back to children's since. Praise God. <laughs> we put Josh into God's hands, and God delivered. The two-year delay was really hard to handle, but his ways are higher than our ways, and we need to trust him. We need to pray continually and wait on his timing. When we returned from that weekend, our answering machine was full. Our mailbox was full of checks and well wishes from complete strangers. People had heard of our struggles, and God had prompted people to give. In the end, we received 1700 and some odd dollars from complete strangers and hat passed around at work. Karina, the bookkeeper, could tally up our expenses that we were still out of pocket, and they were about $14 short of the donations, which is probably about the value of a cassette not tallied. The message was clear. God's in control. God is the storehouse. He sees us, he knows us, and he has plans to prosper and not to harm. The theft, very clearly intended for evil, could have broken us, but we chose to praise God regardless of the situation. And God will work all things for good to those who love him. Through this experience with Josh, the financial drain, and then the, the following blessing, uh, it was clear that we uh, needed to put our trust in Father, not a church, particularly that church. Because of the hurt, we switched to another church and we immediately felt at home. Our pastor was very clear that we were not to switch churches to attend to his without addressing the hurt with our old pastor. We wrote a letter, we sent it to our pastor. <coughs> we never heard a response, but at least we don't need to carry that along with us. I would encourage anybody who's been hurt by another church, write a letter. You know, let them know. Maybe it was us. Maybe we need to seek godly counsel about our hurt. But maybe it was something that they'd overlooked. It's good for your walk, and it could be good for the other church to let them know. After a while at this new church, we joined the worship team. Karina can sing, and I can sing okay. Although I could never sing and clap at the same time. <laughs> Actually, I've always kind of disliked the fact that I never had rhythm. A new worship leader joined our church, and shortly after, all of our drummers moved away. The throne at the drums was empty. It was like it was calling out. I sure miss the drums, but I have no rhythm. Jason, our worship leader, says, sit down, try this. Okay, I can do that. I started playing drums that Sunday, and I stayed on the drums for the next five years. God calls the equipped, <laughs> or he equips the called. Turns out our worship leader has, was a drummer from way back. He still had quite the set at home. So he did some training, and I enjoyed it. At principle five in my journey is do God does equip the called. And for the record, if you're here today, it's because you were called. I have to admit that while I was drumming, I was still a pack-a-day smoker. I felt incredibly guilty sneaking out for that cigarette in between practice and service. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that God delivered me from the cigarettes. I bring this up to say that we don't have to be an uber Christian for God to use us. He can take us where we are as long as we're willing. God will equip the call. <coughs> Round about the same time I started drumming, Okanagan University College announced a pilot project of a trades teacher training program. This was an answer to an unspoken prayer. I just told Karina about a year previous, if the right programs ever came to the Okanagan, I'd quit my job and go back to school. Her response at that time was, careful what you say, I'll hold you to it. <laughs> so that said, when the program came to the Okanagan, she held me to it. We were sitting down discussing what she might do for work, and I felt horrible that she felt certain she'd be chambermaiding or something. I knew she was capable of, of so much more in an office along the lines of bookkeeping her office admin, but she felt ill-equipped to... Uh, to apply for any of those, and most of the jobs advertised were, 20, uh, were 40 hours a week, and she only wanted 25 or 30. In the midst of one of our conversations of which she, what she might do, our pastor dropped in, 
literally in the midst of one of those conversations, and asked if she would consider taking over the bookkeeping and secretarial at the church, effective the week that I quit my job. I love God's timing. First year in college went smoothly for a tornado. <laughs> but it went well, despite what my high school academic teachers said about me. I proved them wrong, with God's help, of course. When that year wrapped up, uh, I was contacted to do first aid for a framing crew building the Christian school. That wrapped up just in time to, to go back to school. Um, sorry, first year I was called to do a renovation that, that lasted the summer. In the second year, I was called to do first aid for a framing crew. God has always provided the work that we've needed. When I finished school, uh, deciding not to pursue teaching as a career, but thankful for the opportunity and growth, uh, Jack phoned me back, and I, I went framing again. When that job was wrapping up, I had another phone call. Karina's uncle had been hurt on the job and needed me to take a house to lock up. Uh, the work has always been there as needed. Actually, I forgot to mention that in school, um, returning to school with a family is quite the financial burden, and not for God. Every time some <laughs> things looked like they were going to get really tight and uncomfortable, God showed up an unexpected bursary that I hadn't applied for, student loan forgiveness or something. God's provision is amazing, and his timing is always right. A couple of years back, we were both quite spiritually dry. Probably a few years back now. Karina had tired of the office admin tra position and trained her a replacement, and after our worship leader left, I grew tired of being on the drums. Our ties to that church were lessening, and we really noticed that Josh had no peers, and we felt quite guilty about that. We started looking around for a new church based simply on our son's need. Little did I know that God had plans for us here, too. God led us to cheers. We thought we were moving for Josh, but looking back, it's clear that God's plans were for us as well. Spiritually, we've all grown clo closer to the Lord and his plans for our lives. We can bring our teen and find lots of peers, or we can bring our grandkids and fit right in with our pastors. <laughs> The last but maybe most important thing I've learned along my journey, and the one that I hope that everybody's able to adopt into their hearts, is something I knew but didn't really know. And that's, we're God's children. He's our dad. Dads, what wouldn't you do for your kids? Brian just flew halfway around the world for his daughter. How much more would our God in heaven, whose ability is limitless, whose knowledge of us is perfect. As human fathers, we're going to fail. We're going to let our kids down. God won't. God has been so faithful to my family. We've done what we're able to love him, to walk it out when we don't feel like it. And some days that hasn't been much. And maybe in return, but mostly because he loves us unconditionally, he's provided for our every need. For the last four years, I've been self-employed. My casual work with Karina's uncle turned into a full-time self-employed venture. I've had no holiday pay or EI to fall back on. With the cost of fuel, cost of tools and insurance, etc., we've had just enough to get by. Working steady has been mandatory, but God's provided. When Otto's projects would end, Karina's dad would start a project and that would last through the winter, and so on and so forth. It's just always been there. Otto's now 72, and despite what I'd hoped, he's unlikely to, to turn his business over to anybody. And Karina's dad is now in his forever house. I figured I'd run out of work back in October, but things kept getting added to the list. The lead time, however, was getting shorter and shorter, and I could see work running out. I knew a new chapter was in the, work, in the works, and I spent my drives to and from work looking at God's provision for our life and how incredibly faithful he has been. How many times he's shown up to take care of us in ways that I can't take any credit for. That's how this whole project got started, was those drives to and from work. Change can be scary, but when you're able to put your trust in God without any doubts and know that he's in control, change can be exciting. I began to look forward to a new chapter, which is totally outside my natural. I know that God has better plans than my own. Now, Reminder that that faith can't be taught, but it comes from walking it out day after day, regardless of how we feel. 
Monday, January 21st, I was completely out of work. I'd known the day was coming, but I wasn't afraid. I had no EI, no savings account on earth, but I knew God's plans, or God had plans. My resumes were on the dash of the truck, and I was ready to go out and look for a job. It came down with an instant flu or something. I couldn't leave the house for the day. Somehow, I wasn't worried. I knew God was in control. I got a call that night from a local contractor that I really wanted to work for. We had previously talked, but he had nothing to offer. Now, he had a day's work. By that Friday, I guess I'd passed the test because he brought me on full time. And I love it. It's work that I really love doing. The principles that I've laid out are the first or at least the more major of the principles that I've learned, the ones that stick out in my mind as being essential for me to walk in love the verb when I don't feel love the mushy feelings. As with a marriage, love isn't centered around and will never be centered around feelings alone. Love is a verb that requires action. As with marriage, though, when we act with love and respect and admiration for our partner, the feelings usually follow. To look again at the prodigal son, the father had likely worked hard all of his life. The son basically slapped him in the face saying, I don't care about the work of your hands, I don't care about your legacy, just show me the money. He squandered it away. He hopped on a private jet and headed off to L.A. for a while and then to the Bahamas. He lusted after Rihanna, worked at, worshipped at the altars of ACDC and drank Dom Perignon and JD until he was flat, broke, and dumpster diving for survival. He came crawling back, hoping to be made a slave for the slaves ate better than him. How did the father react? Welcomed him with open arms. There's nothing you can do to strip God's love for you. There is nothing unforgivable if you come to his feet and ask. That's grace. But God calls us to obedience and delights in it. God is in control. He loves you, wants the best for you, or wants the best for you and everyone who loves him. Remember that love is a verb to walk it out when you don't feel like it. Ask him how. It may not look the same for you as it does for me. Talk to him about tithing and see what he'd have you do. Work for God, not for man. Trust him unconditionally. In all things, praise him, for you never know what he'll use to bless you. Know that God equips the called, and every one of you here is, is here because you were called. But above all, know that you're his son. You're his daughter. He wants the best for you and your heir to his inheritance. I got you. <laughs> I just uh, want to thank you for sharing your heart, Greg. And uh, I think there's some truths there that as a church uh, we really need to grab onto that. Those principles, they're for all of us. And uh, you can try to get away from it, but the fact of the matter is they're God's principles. And God has uh, set these things out in his word. And I would really encourage you to grab a hold of those because God will he, he will walk through you, uh, life with you and you can trust in him when you've placed your trust in him. And for many of us, that's, that's hard. It's a lot, for a lot of us, most of us, it starts with the tithing. Yeah. You have to place your trust with him. Can I have the worship team come up and... Uh, just want to thank you, Greg. We appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Thanks. And uh, thanks for your willingness. <laughs> Not too bad for a grandpa. <laughs>